for my next build, I'm going to be building a hall tree, which is a fancy word for kind of entrance storage and a coat rack. And these are the, the reference photos the customer sent over, but they asked me to kind of use them as reference and put my own spin on things. Um, they particularly like the rustic look, and whenever someone says that, um, I use the opportunity to use reclaimed materials, which is one of my more favorite ways to build. I'm building this in two pieces. I'm going to be building the bottom part and then this top part. The top part will attach probably with some sliding dados into place and I might even transport it in two pieces so it's easier to transport and since I'm using reclaimed materials this is all going to be solid lumber which means it's probably going to weigh a lot and it's just going to be easier to move. So for some of these videos going forward I think I'm going to condense some of this information so they're not so long and that's mainly because when you're building a structure like this especially since I'm going to be using reclaimed materials, we're not probably going to be using the same materials. If you're using an old door, even if I'm using an old door, they're probably not going to be the same size. So I'm going to kind of rough out the dimensions and then you could build it the way you want out of the objects you want. And for cabinets like this, I've had this channel for a little over a year now and I've built so many cabinets and the basic um, method for building these is going to be the same. And it's getting to be a little redundant starting out by showing how to build a cabinet or certain parts of these builds every single time. So I'm going to go ahead and show you where I'm at right now. And this is the basic base. And the sides of this are from an old door that I cut down to size. The top is half inch um, ply and the bottom I wanted to be thicker but I didn't have three quarters so I doubled up half inch birch veneer. The whole thing is put together with a dado on the bottom about a half inch from the bottom and I usually set my dados about halfway through my piece and the top is going to be rabbits and this piece on top is so thin because it's going to have a very thick almost three inch top which will be screwed to this and secure everything up. And then the back is put in place. It's just a regular backer with rabbits I cut into the back and it fits right in place like that. So the dimensions for this are based on the dimensions of their home. So the final dimensions are going to be 18 inches wide, but this is only about 16 because you're going to have a, half, a three quarter inch face frame as well as most likely three quarter inch doors on front. So you have to be able to add an inch and a half onto your final measurements. And the whole thing's going to be 44 inches wide. But once again, I want an overhang on my top. So this is only about 42 inches wide and then you could calculate how you want to cut your plywood base on your rabbits These are about half inch rabbits half inch dados final height for this I based off of standard chair height I went a little bit lower since it is a bench You're only going to be sitting on there briefly probably putting on your shoes or whatnot So the final height of this is going to be just a little over 16 inches and I calculated that three inch top into this which makes from the ground up, this is going to be about 13 and a half inches. Also glued together the top for this, which is made out of old joists from a porch. I actually got these from my neighbor a couple years ago, and this is actually the last of that lumber. You can see how nice this old pine is. You just don't see tight um, growth rings and tight grain like that on most newer lumbers. So this sort of stuff has a lot of nails in it. I have a throwaway blade I use in my table saw and I just ripped these square and then ripped it to size and glued them together with some biscuits. Super, super explanatory. So I have this piece left over from um, ripping down the slabs for my tabletop and I'm going to use that for my face frame. So my face frames on the side, it's going to be three quarters of an inch. So it's going to be the same thickness as my side. And I'm doing that because that gives me the most options for the hinges I want to use. The top and the bottom are going to be the same, which will go from the floor to the top edge of that bottom shelf. And that looks to be about an inch and a half.
I'm going to rip down a three quarter inch strip and an inch and a half strip from that leftover stock and then be able to start framing this out. So I ripped that piece down to an inch and a half and then I cut two, three, I actually cut three three quarter inch uh, slabs off of that. One will become my bottom rail, one will become my top rail. And then with the third one and a half inch strip, I then cut that into three quarters and that will go on my sides. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to cut these down to my perfect, perfect width so they'll fit on there. And then I'm going to be joining these with lap joints. So I'm going to be putting a lap joints on all four corners as well as cutting this down and putting a lap joint on that. Now usually if you've seen some of my other videos on big cabinet jobs. I attach these with splines. It just makes life easier if you have that many pieces. On these smaller jobs, it's not really worth the extra effort and attaching them with biscuits or even brads will give you the same result. But I'm using laps instead of pocket hole screws because this is going to be finished with, I believe, a polyurethane or at the very least some sort of clear coat, which means you want your joints to be seamless and look really good. And sometimes with pocket hole screws or even especially butt joints, you'll get gaps and where the two pieces meet, they'll warp and change over time and you can get separation. If you glue these together with laps, it makes a really solid joint. Now you can use pocket hole screws for this. This is also a very good method for making face frames. I just prefer lap joints um, in this sort of application. So I'm going to cut these lap joints on my radial arm saw and one of the reasons I got rid of the chop saw, first off it wasn't technically mine, but I also had the opportunity, someone gave this to me for free and it's so versatile as a tool. You can't, you could do cross cuts, you could do dados, you could raise the blade and do lap joints. It's just really great. So I'm going to do that instead of doing them on my table saw because it's a little bit easier actually to cut laps on the radial arm saw. I've only done it a couple times but it's just, it goes faster and it's easier to set up. So to mark those laps I just took my edges, put them there and put a line and I'll cut to the inside of this line and kind of creep up on that joint to make sure the edges are flush. And then I did the same thing for these. I put these on top and marked how far down those come. Then I went to my radial arm saw and I took some scrap pieces and I cut two laps and raised the blade slowly until they were perfectly flush. So now I have a nice flush joint on there. They go down the same amount and I could take these over there and cut all my laps. So there's that face frame in place. You could see how those laps look from the side. There's really no gaps once you kind of squeeze everything together. And running your hand up and down the sides of these, you'll, you'll feel it's right when there's no overlap. And then of course I checked all my corners for square to make sure they're square. If your face frame's not square, no matter what doors you're making, it just makes life a lot harder to make the doors mount and look good on top of this cabinet. So before I go about attaching this, I'm going to attach the top. And that's because if I remove this one piece, you can see that since this plywood is so thin, it bows. So if I put the top on, it will pull this flat to the top, and then I could go about mounting my face frame. So the table, the seat top is going to act just like a table top. 
has biscuits in it, but this, this wood is going to expand and contrast based on relative humidity. I don't want to put any glue on the top. I just want to attach it with a couple screws to allow for that seasonal movement. So what I'm going to do from the inside is drill some oversized holes and then sink some screws with some washers into the underside of that top. The oversized holes will allow for the hardware to move with the expansion and contrast expansion and contraction of that top and the top won't split or crack. So to get these in there, I drilled two quarter inch holes, elongated them, used quarter inch washers and one and five eighths inch screws in those holes. I mounted them just about in the middle and that will allow them to expand and can, uh, to move along with the expansion and contraction of the top. Now I drove these in pretty solidly because I want this edge flush when I put up my face frame. So I wanted to drive that into the top. Before I deliver this to the customer, I'm going to back off these screws with a hand, uh, with a hand screwdriver, probably about a quarter of a turn. Because if they're too tight, then the purpose of making those elongated holes is negated. They won't move. You want them a little loose. And this top, like most tabletops, are so heavy, you don't need to uh, uh, you know, anchor them super securely with a ton of hardware. This isn't going anywhere. So now I can start attaching my face frame. The way I'm going to attach this face frame now that everything's lined up is with biscuits and brads. You could see I went around and marked um, along the edge just a couple spots. I think there's two on each side and four on the bottom and then two on this side where I'm going to put those biscuits. I'm only going to use number zero biscuits. This isn't for strength or anything. It's just to help line everything up and keep it flat while it dries. The top, since that plywood's so thin, I'm not going to put biscuits there. I'm probably just going to put some brads. So I could take this all off, put those biscuit holes in, and then reattach it. And of course, when I'm gluing it together, I'm going to be putting glue on these lap joints. So my neighbor actually gave me this old beadboard style panel door a couple months ago and I'm gonna, this is going to be the backer for the project and it's kind of sunny out so I don't know if you could tell that it's mint green and I'm going to be stripping all the paint off of it to start the project and nice thing about this beadboard style door is the surfaces are pretty flat and stripping it's going to be fairly easy. I'm just going to use a chemical stripper and get most of that paint off. So I think the last five minutes or so of this video, I kind of put most of the footage I have of stripping all the paint off this furniture. I kind of put it at the end because you can build this hall tree with any materials you want. You might not have old, old materials you're using. So I just kind of put it at the end. So if you want to see how I go about taking multiple layers of paint off of stuff, you can. But it's not really necessary to watch this to be able to build the hall tree.
So this is where I'm at after my first um, round of the stripper. And it looks like there's multiple layers of paint. You've got a couple layers of disgusting tannish brown. And then it looks like there's some sort of purple on top of that. A whitish and then this, this mint green color. So since this is a flat board and I've been using um, a wire brush for in between to get those beads and that's getting that really well. So since this is a flat surface, I'm probably only going to do one more round of stripper and then I could hit it with a belt sander, which will save some time. So this is after two coats and I got pretty much all that paint off. A belt sander will remove this pretty quickly. And usually when you use this stuff, you're left with kind of this paste putty mess of, of stripper and paint. And a great way to remove that is to take some sawdust throw it over the whole surface and rub it in and it will absorb all of that and remove even some more paint. One of the problems with using a chemical stripper besides the fact that it smells, so you should be doing it in a well ventilated area, is that since it's viscous, you're fighting gravity the whole time. So you lose a lot of material by it dripping off the ends of pieces. So what I did was I went to the store and got one of these cheap like $1.50 roasting pans. I fill it with some stripper and then I could kind of make almost a bath for these pieces to go in. They could soak in there for about a half an hour. You could do multiples at a time. And it really helps remove the stuff and also saves a lot of material since you can reuse whatever goes in here. A pile of louvers that uh, came out of the stripper that I scraped all the rest of that paint off. And then all I'll do is use a little oscillating sander to sand off the last little bit of residue and then these are ready to be reassembled. This is the pair of louvered shutters I'm using for this build. These are going to make up the sides. And I originally wasn't going to use um, these louvered shutters just because they take forever to strip down. I'm not a huge fan of shabby chic. So if I use any reclaim materials that are painted, I usually get them to about 98% stripped. And on these louvered shutters, it just takes, just takes forever. There's multiple layers of paint. There's a weird paint from the way that they were uh, paint was met before and the easiest way I found to deal with these is I take the tilt bars off um, I'm kind of a purist and I don't like wrecking things but it's just so much easier to disassemble these and strip them versus um, keeping them together which I've done in the past and then these are put together with mortise and tenons there's usually screws in here which stop putting your furniture back together if they have tenons with screws it does nothing more than snap the tenon and eventually that screw rusts if it's outside and it makes the matter worse but I took the screws out and I drilled out those tenons and they, these popped right apart because they usually aren't put together with any sort of glue so once I had all these parts apart it was a lot easier to sand off the loose paint which is a majority of the paint and then use stripper on the rest of it. I don't love using chemicals but I, there's really not any other great way to get this stuff off. This is my pile of louvers that are all ready to go. I have a little bit of paint left on the sides and then I can start putting them back together. I also think it's worth pointing out um, now that we seem to live in a very consumable plastic based society that nowadays you'll hear a lot of people talk about how it has to be pressure treated or it has to be a plastic or a plastic composite to last outside. These shutters are off of the Victorian house. They actually came off of my neighbor's house right on that corner you can't see it and that means that they're from the late half of the 1800s and they were on the exterior of our house exposed to sun and rain and yes there is some splitting on these but all the joints the tenons and the mortises are totally intact and I'm going to be putting these back together with glue and they're going to be super solid and sturdy there's very little to no rot on any of these and this is just regular basic pine so things to think about the next time you're planning 
your exterior build, if you build it well and you use nice materials and you keep up on the upkeep of them, obviously these were painted, things will last a lot longer.